Here at Paddy Power, we're the home of the Money Back Special, with some incredible offers every single week. Check out the website or app today. Terms and conditions apply. 18plusbegumbleaware.org. Hello and welcome to this racing postcast. Uh, it's Monday and we're going to look back on the week's racing and the weekend, of course. Joined by Jimmy Hill, Mark Boylan and Paul Binfield from Paddy Power. This week we had Ascot, Haydock, Newmarket and Deauville to look at and also some international action as well. The main showpiece arguably was the Shergar Cup. Maybe not everyone's cup of tea, but the rest of the world team won it. Hayley Turner was awarded the Silver Saddle Award. Jimmy, are you for or against the Shergar Cup as a rule, would you say? I'm not, I'm not a fan of the, the prominence it's given. I, I think we should be having better quality racing on a, on a Saturday, to be honest with you. Um, you know, where in August it's, you know, the middle of summer, we should be having group ones. Um, the concept, I'm, I'm not saying totally get rid of it, but maybe it's something more for a Friday night or a Sunday afternoon. Mm, yeah, I'm sure many people agree with that. Um, but it serves a purpose and uh, it was good show put on as per usual. What was your sort of performance of the of the meeting? Well, Hayley Turner lit it up again. I mean, she, she loves it, doesn't she? Uh, I thought her ride on uh, the Mark Johnston horse who won the classic Saparinka was very good. Timed it beautifully. Um, that was a lovely ride. I mean, you know, some of the, some of the racing was good and, and it was good to see some of the overseas riders taking part. Gave it a bit of flavour. Uh, but she was a star of the show once again. Yeah. Um, I know in our fever piece, Mark, we referred to it... Um, David Carr, I think it was, who referred to the Shergar Cup as almost like a gateway drug. And I must admit, there's people from school who live in London who I haven't spoken to in years, and they ended up turning up clearly just for the day out. So it does have a draw in that aspect. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting, Mark Johnson's comments about the colours. Like, I, I respect for what Mark Johnson says a lot of the time because I think he's a, he's a good straight-talking individual. And uh, I, I just felt, though, that the colours, they have to say that way. You know, I, I think it makes sense myself. I understand from the owner's point of view, you're going to want to have your own colours, but I think uh, you know it, it, it's a good day to be involved in it. I think it's a great chance for international riders to to gain a bit of profile, and uh, if you're saying it's impacting your friends, it's obviously a good result too from a young race course point of view, but uh, you know, I, I thought it worked quite well. It's not something that I count down the days to every year, but uh, I have nothing against it either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mark Johnson, of course, as Mark said, he hit out about the colours uh, situation. Not happy about that. Binners, Shogar Cup, I presume you're in favour. Well, I am, Maddie, but I'm not personally. I'm not a massive fan. Um, I think it's great that it brings in young, young people, young young kids to to Ascot for the day. But um, it's not my cup of tea. And I agree with Mark Johnson on the colours. I've been following racing for over thirty years, and I still have trouble sometimes picking out one horse that I'm following in a race, let alone when there's three or four in the same colours. Um, possibly an, an idea is to give. Let let the horses run in their owners' colours, but give them a t you know, a couple of armbands on each on each arm, green or red or whatever it is, and and maybe that could could, could work for the team thing, which which might well appeal to young kids who are used to following football teams. But it's not really my cup of tea, Maddie. I like that as an idea, definitely. I can see where Mark's coming from with the colours. I must admit, I know some of them have. They're all obviously in their individual colours per teams, but they have sort of stars on some, chevrons on some. It can be hard to tell, even though they do have the names on the back, which obviously you can't see when they're racing. Um, anyway, we'll move on to the action elsewhere. And uh, some good races at Haydock, including the Rose of Lancaster, which was won by a Dave on his beloved soft ground. And, and Jimmy, it is, that is the key with this horse, isn't it, I think, now? Absolutely. No, that was a good performance. Short price favourite, but and you know, so he's expected to win. But um, I, I thought it was uh, impressive the way he he saw off two decent three year olds. Really, uh, the question is now whether he can kind of go on from that and, and, and move up to the next level, which is a you know group two, group one horse. Um, he probably does need that sort of ground, I would think, to to reach that level. Uh, but the cheap pieces have certainly helped him. Um, and maybe he's in, he's in great form at the moment. Yeah, entries in both the Judmont International and the Champion Stakes. Champion Stakes probably more likely to get the ground based on the last couple of runnings, you'd think. Uh, Binners, would you give him an each way shout in those? Um, yeah, um, certainly in the um, Champion Stakes, Maddie. Um, we cut him for that for, uh, to 10 to 1 from 12 to 1. I, f I think the reasoning behind it is we left him unchanged for the Judmont International uh, at 20 to 1. I think the reasoning is that we think he's more likely to get his favourite soft ground at Ascot in October. And, 
you know, when he does get his conditions in his favour, he's an absolute monster. Yeah, interestingly, I thought William Haggis, who is in blinding form, more of which later on, uh, he said he could be better after a bit of a break and he wasn't really necessarily that happy with some of his performances this season. So it could be interesting if they leave off him now and then head to Champions Day. Uh, Mark, any thoughts on a Dave? Yeah, I'd be echoing what, what you've said there so far. Um, I'm not sure if he's a genuine Group 1 horse, but he's the sort of horse that could run well in a race like the Champions Stakes because some of them, if it did turn up deep ground, they won't handle it. And you can be sure this fella will. Um, I'm not too sure. He's the sort of horse that if you had yourself, you could plot your races, but you're always going to be depending on weather forecast. So I'd say he's a difficult horse to plan. And if you had a race in mind that you thought would suit him, you're, you're always going to have to be looking for the Norwegian weather forecast to make sure you're on the ball. So, uh, But there should be nice races to be on with him. I don't think he's genuine Group 1 class yet, but uh, I thought the way to support something to note was uh, the way to support for Raise U. Um, he was well backed, albeit that Wissa Hicken's uh, withdrawal did affect the market, but... Uh, I think he's a nice horse going forward now. Um, wouldn't give up on him just yet. And I'd be interested if he stays in training next season. He's a, he's a nice one to look forward to. Him. Yeah, he is indeed. Him and Pondus, the three-year-olds who sort of tried to put it up to a day, but they couldn't do it. Um, we'll see where he goes then. Another winner for Haggis on Saturday was Miss O'Connor. Really unexposed filly. Mark, she came from uh, Jimmy Fiend's stable. Yeah, with John Fiend over here. Uh, real shoot operator, John. He's well able to, to get them ready. Um Maybe not with first main winners historically, but uh, this one won really nice at Gorn. It won at a big price, I think, but it was nibbled at in the market, if I do remember right. Uh, no, just loves that sort of ground as well. Looks a shrewd acquisition for the Haggis team. Very impressive at Nottingham and back, backed it up again here. Um, no, it look, looks a proper horse now going forward uh, and sort of one that, that could make her impact at Group 3, Group 2 level to find the right opportunity. and A nice one. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think William said she's not got any, you know, really fancy entries, Jimmy, but she still looked quite green and inexperienced to me in that she was waiting for the other horses to come to her and in the final half furlong, she really stretched away and stamped her class on the field. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's done nothing wrong and um, there should be more to come from her. Um, I mean, if, if, if she's talking about a real, becoming a real group class filly, I think she's still got some improvement, uh, improvement to come. But, uh, you know, th they were some solid types in behind and she won with authority. They never really looked like they were going to beat her. Uh, she handled the ground well. Yeah, and, uh, you know, another sort of different take on the action. West End Girl, she won the uh, Sweet Solera. How impressed were you with her, a daughter of Golden Horn, of course? Yeah, that, that was a typical Mark Johnston filly, really. I mean, she just toughed it out. Didn't look like she was going to win um, coming down the hill, but the moment she hit the rising ground, she just stuck her neck out. Um, more more stronger and uh, better stamina than the rest of them. Uh, I didn't think it was that good a race, to be honest with you. So that may be the uh, ceiling of her ability. Yeah, I can't necessarily see her being that high up in some of the anti-post market binners. Uh, did you cut her at all? No, actually, Maddie, we introduced her into the 1,000 guineas at 33 to 1, uh, so first show. Uh, not sure she's going to make too much of an impact, but um, you can do no more than win these races. Indeed. Uh, and as Jimmy said, typical Mark Johnston performance, really. Um, we'll look at some of the international action now. Of course, yesterday we had the Jack Lamawa and won by Romanised in impressive style. Uh, Jimmy, you know, a horse that's been a bit unlucky throughout his career on a couple of occasions, but he put his best foot forward here and he is a decent horse on his day. Well, he surprised me, to be honest with you. Um, on Sunday. Uh, I thought maybe his Irish 2000 Guineas win was a bit of a fluke last season, but you know he was really strongly fancied for the lock inch. He was undoubtedly unlucky in the, the Queen Anne, should have finished a lot closer there, never got the rub of the green through the race. And I thought he was he won with plenty of authority. Um, so in a group one like that, I mean, you've got to be a good horse. Uh, it wasn't a great Mawa. Uh, the Coronation Stakes winner Watch Me was a bit disappointing. Again, maybe showing that the three-year-old fillies aren't up to much. But uh, I thought he, he travelled much the best, quicker, nicely. Uh, and yeah, he, a race like the QE2, he's definitely got to be a contender now. Yeah, he sure has. Mark, um, good to see some sort of lesser known, if you like, connections back in the, in the Group 1 winner's enclosure with uh, Ken Condon and Billy Lee. Um, bit of a romance story, this one. Uh, look, to be honest, of all the results this weekend, this one, I, I'm smiling even thinking about it. I really am so delighted for Ken Condon. And Billy Lee, too. He's a world-class rider. But uh, Ken Condon, arguably the nicest man in Irish racing and a really capable operator when given the ammunition. And I really hope this horse gets the credit he deserves now. You know, he's, he's a classic winner, albeit now that I was ready to 
throw the laptop at the television watching uh, Roman and I was doing US Navy flag in the Guineas last year because I was pretty deep in, in Navy flag, unfortunately. But this horse has just not got the luck uh, previously. Like in the Queen Anne, unlucky. Uh, no, okay, maybe not an unlucky loser, but he should have been closer. Uh, and he's been brilliantly plotted out from Ken. Uh, I, like the horse doesn't want rattling quick ground. And that's the one thing I'd worry about if they are talking with the Breeders' Cup mile for him. Because um, he, he doesn't... Previously, when you're around the St. James's Palace, they mentioned that Ascot ground, there was no kindness in it, and that just that counted against him. Whereas if he gets a little bit of kindness in the ground, not that it's on the soft side, he doesn't need it like that, but just as it was there at the weekend, it fell perfectly. He's a really classy horse, got loads of speed. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next, but I, I'm just delighted for Ken. It's a fantastic result, and great for Irish racing to be winning a race like that. Disappointed with the filly, watch me a little bit, but uh, the coronation, as Jimmy says, has taken a few knocks. Yeah, it sure has. Uh, Romanised anyway. Well, let's turn our attentions back to him, uh, Binners. And did you cut him for the QE2? We did indeed, Matt. It was lovely to see the form of the Paddy Power Minstrel Stake boosted again. Hey Gammon was second to Romanised in that. And he still the same position in the Lennox Stakes. And Romanised, brilliant for Ken Condon. We cut him for the QE2 initially, 10 from 16. He's still that price, but then Ken was talking more about going for the Prix de la Forêt in France or the Breeders' Cup mile. We haven't got a foray market up at the moment, but we introduced him for the Breeders' Cup mile at 14 to 1, and uh, it'll be great to see Ken have, have, a, have a run uh, over the pond. Yeah, it sure will be. One horse who really impressed in America was, of course, Bricks and Mortar, who won the Arlington Million, beating Magic Wand. Jimmy, this for me is a serious horse, and I don't know if he goes to the you know Breeders' Cup Mile or the Breeders' Club uh, Turf, but I think he's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a big follower of American racing, but he he'd have to be a contender for that. Um, you know, Magic won as a good yardstick, so to beat that one as easily as he did, um, got to be got to be a serious horse, um, and uh, he'll have these conditions in the Breeders' Cup. So yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, the trainer does very, very well with these types. Marks, any thoughts? Did you catch that race? Yeah, I was impressed by the horse. He's been impressive all year. Uh, just continues to keep winning in that sort of company. On the turf, I don't know if there's a real standout horse over there at the minute, but if there is, this is it. Um, you know, Robert Bruce was a, a leg legitimate contender coming in here. I thought Hunting Horn had a big chance, but maybe he just needs a mile and a half. And fair credit to Magic Wand. She seems to up her game when she goes over there every so often. And, uh, you know... I'm not saying she's a... If, look, if she ran her in a group one over here, it, it's not quite run to the same level as it will across the water. Um, but no, take nothing away from the winner. He'd be very interesting. I wonder what sort of bullets Europe will fire at him in the Breeders' Cup. Um, hard to see where we'll be going. But uh, if Enable turned up, for example, in a turf against him, it would be no contest. But I don't know if that's the way we're going to be going. I think it's a really, really solid horse. Yeah, be nice to see them, you know, take on, take on, uh, enable taking on some fresh opposition. Uh, Binners, what price is he for the, the two Breeders' Cup targets? Well, Mark says no contest for the turf, but we, we make an able 100 to 30 favourite. Crystal Ocean in between at 7 to 2 and Bricks and Mortar at 5 to 1. So maybe it's a bit closer than Mark suggests if they all show up uh, in the Breeders' Cup mile. That one's headed by Circus Maximus at six to one, but Bricks and Malta once again not far behind at seven to one with King of Comedy at eight to one for John Gosden. That'll do for the review section then, and uh, make sure you remember that you can bet via the Racing Post app. So for any of those prices that Bin has mentioned, if they take your fancy, you can download the app via the Google Play Store. What's my horse's handicap? The fact that you're backing him. Everyone loves a newbie. That's why Paddy Power Games are giving all new customers 60 free spins on daily jackpot games. New Paddy Power Games customers only. One per customer. T's and C's apply. 18 plus. BeGambleAware.org. Welcome back to this Monday postcast. Now we're going to take a look at some of the midweek action. And starting on Thursday at Salisbury, the 350 is the Tattersall's Sovereign Stakes, a Group 3 over a mile. Some of the highest rated in here, Accidental Agent and Duke of Hazard, the glorious Goodwood winner. Jimmy, who did your sort of main selection turn out to be? Um, Mads, I'm going to give one more chance here to great Scott, Tom Dascombe's cut. Yes. Um, I remain convinced he's a, he's a group horse. Not straightforward, but I mean, if you look at his, some of his form last season, he was fifth in the Vertemps of Charity at Doncaster, group one. Look at some of the horses who finished in front of him. He was only beaten, he was beaten just over a length. You had um, Magna Grecia, Phoenix of Spain, and Circus Maximus, so that's really good form. Uh, he was he did well in the, the Greenham as well, first time mm. out, finishing second. Uh, and um, I fancied him to run a big race in the Hampton Court, but he just never settled. 
Uh, I thought the step up in trip might suit, but I mean, he, he got away with his jockey down the hill at the start, and after that, it was game over. So I put a line through that performance, uh, and I think uh, a stiff mile, um, which you get at Salisbury on the back of the forecast rain they had on the Wednesday, will make conditions perfect for him. Okay, shameless plug from me here. I, uh, I, I like another horse who ran in that Hampton Court Stakes, who has entered up here in King Ottica. Um, just mentioned him in my uh, RFO column for the week. So. Definitely already nailed my colours to the mass with that one. I think we're yet to see the best of King Ottica, especially if there is some rain. Good third in what was a red, red hot Hampton Court, as I think you said, Jimmy, with Sangarius and Fox Chairman and Roseman horses like that, all in that race. Um, we'll go over to you next, Mark. Any thoughts on the Sovereign Stakes? Yeah, I'd have respect for Ottica, right? Real nice horse. Um, look, we'll get a better idea when the full field finalises, but uh, I like the look of Accidental Agent. Um, look, maybe I'm too forgiven at this stage of the day. I have to... A trait that David Jennings often speaks about. Unfortunately, I think I've been blessed with it too, or cursed, whatever you want to look at it. But uh, I'd be willing to give him another chance here. Uh, just the class angler, the race, and stiff my and ask it suits him. Think this will too. So, uh, look, I, I, I won't come down firmly on one just yet, but I have respect for Ottinger, but uh, accidental agent, probably the one I'd just, just come down at the minute. Yeah, certainly a talented horse who's been a bit tricky. We yet to see the best of him this season. Bin, has any thoughts on this race? Well, you mentioned accidental agent and Duke Hazard. Um, I'd go for Accidental Agent if you could guarantee he got off to a good start. He seems a bit quirky and he's been slowly away the last time after refusing before that. So I'm going to go for Duke of Hazard. Um, I, I thought it was very imp impressive at um, Goodwood when justifying fav favouritism in the thoroughbred stakes. Um, despite getting a terrible run in, on a couple of occasions, sir, that was a marvellous performance. And the Paul Cole team think the world of this one. So I'm going to go for Duke of Hazard. Yeah, headgear certainly seems to have made all the difference with him. Also on Thursday then, uh, at Leopardstown, at 7 o'clock is the Invesco Pension Consultants Desmond Stakes. Now, we could see a classic contender reappear here in Mad Moon, of course, second, uh, sorry, fourth in the Newmarket Guineas, second in the Derby, and then fourth in the Irish Derby. Um, Mark, are we, are we yet to really see what this horse is capable of? Uh, I think he's had a good time, I think, so far this season, without getting a, a win to reward him. I, I, I make no secret about it. I'm the, the chairperson of the, the Mad Moon fan club. I've been there since day one when he won on, on debut at Leperstown. I've really been a fan of the horse. Um, and I'm delighted for Kevin Prendergast that this horse could be could give him a group one, really, at the in the twilight of his career. Um, but, you know, it, it didn't work out for him last time in the Cora, and it didn't work out for plenty of them. You know, we're still in the dark somewhat as to whether Sovereign's result is something we can take uh, pretty solidly. Um, I think he was kind of a hostage of fortune in the Irish Derby in the sense that I'd imagine Chris Hayes' idea was to track Anthony Van Dyke. And when Anthony Van Dyke didn't get there in time, and when you had, at the same time, Broom kind of half fell out of the stalls, I think that's kind of what happened there. And you've got Sovereign out in front who was, was able to dominate. But uh, I, I think this horse is plenty of speed going back to a mile. You know, I spoke to Kevin Prendergast for a piece that we did uh, yesterday or, or the day before, and uh, he said the horse couldn't be better. And uh, said that you know, I asked him about the drop back to a mile because obviously he's been competing over further the last twice. But uh, he said he ran well over seven furlongs at the start of the year, which is a good point that he made behind the, the Madrid handicap winner and uh, giving him three pounds too. So, look, I, I, I think Mad Moon should win this on ratings. He's clear. And I'm just looking forward to seeing him getting back in there as champion stakes, please God, at the end of the season because uh, that's the conditions that will really see the best of him, I think. A mile and a quarter at Leopard Sound. We got quick ground last year. You saw how good he was in Irish Champions again last year. I'll bring it on. I can't wait for it. So hopefully he's uh, he's still in the same sort of form after a heavy start to the season. Bring it on. Those are the words from Mark Boyle and Jimmy. Would you be so confident that he'd handle the drop back to a mile? I don't know if I could be more confident than the Matt, than uh, what Mark's saying. But I'm I'm like Mark. I'm a big fan of him. Um, yeah, I think that the the drop back in trip will suit. Um, he was a bit unfortunate in the Derby. He ran such a good race. So he just probably got racing a bit too soon uh, in the straight. And um, he was probably feeling the effects of that at the Curra, which was a very messy race. It's a weird division, isn't it, at the minute, really? Anthony Van Dyke, I mean, he ran no race in the King George. As Mark mentioned, Sovereign, we don't know where we're at with him. And even in the Epsom Derby, they all finished in a bit of a heap, didn't they? We'd, what's going so, on? So, so the Epsom Derby form has worked out in, in some areas. I mean, Circus Maximus and mm. Japan, of course. I mean, both those horses have franked the form. Uh, Anthony Van Dijk, I, I felt had a very hard race at Epsom. I'm not surprised he hasn't really shown his best since then. Uh, and I don't think Mad Moon was necessarily at his best at the Cara either, but I thought Chris Hayes looked after him there. He's been freshened up a bit. He won't be at his best here, I don't think, because the Irish Champion Stakes will probably be his uh, big target. 
Um, but uh, yeah, in this company, I would have thought he'd have too much glass for them. Okay, uh, and Binners finally. Yeah, the guys have said it all really. Um, Maddie, I, I think it'll take a brave man to take on Mad Moon. Sure, he was disappointing in the Irish derby, but this is quite a drop in class. Um, and I'm not concerned about the mile at all either. Um, I, I think he ran a cracker, cracker in the English Guineas. He needed to be stand side that day, really. He was second of 16 in his group, and, and I think he, he'll just be too good for these rivals. OK, we'll move on to Friday then. The 6.45 is the Coma Group International Irish St. Ledger Trial Stakes. It's at the Curra and it's a Group 3. Plenty of Aidan O'Brien entries here, as you'd anticipate. Mark, do you have an idea of who might turn up? Are you getting your crystal ball out to tell us? I, I'd sooner find out the Euro Millions numbers for the next two weeks, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm not too sure what will happen here. Um, but I'd be interested to see if Capri runs because he's a horse that has been tried at staying distances. It hasn't quite worked out from this season, but you know it's worth noting that early in the year, Aidan O'Brien was kind of making this horse out to be his uh, Ascot Gold Cup horse. So if he lined up, I'd be interested to see what he can do. Uh, but hard to have a, an opinion with any great conviction here. Obviously, Master Reality's Ascot Gold Cup run was was, was top notch. Um, if he could reproduce something like that, he'd be hard to beat. And Falcon Eight is in there as well, a, a real smart call, but he's the sort of one that. You'd, you'd need the longest distance you can get for this lad. He, re I don't know if a mile and six might even be a bit sharp from um, Smart Colt though. So looking forward to seeing what we can do. But uh, yeah, probably Capri if he lined up here. I'd be interested to give him another chance. Yeah, former, you know, really classy horse Irish Derby winner, St Ledger winner, etc. Jimmy, but Capri, God, he's been frustrating, hasn't he? Very frustrating. Uh, he could be coming back. Uh, we sh we shall wait and see. Um, that was a bit bit of a better run in the Gold Cup uh, at Royal Ascot. Um, but I'll, I'll go for Falcon 8, who took another step in the right direction at Sandown. Young, improving stayer for Dermot Weld. I, I think the Irish St. Ledger is definitely the big target for him. Um, and I would have thought he'd take his chance, providing the ground's not too slow. OK, we're going to rattle through one more race before we look at the Hungerford Stakes um, on Saturday. Binners, any thoughts on the Irish St. Ledger trial? Well, Mark's kind of stolen my thunder. He went for Capri, but talked about a couple of a couple of others, including Master of Reality for Joseph O'Brien. He was only just beaten in the Gold Cup, as Mark said, behind Stradivarius, and he loves a bit of cut in the ground. So if, if he shows up, I think he'll go well. Also at the current on Friday, then, is the Royal Whip Stakes, a group three over a mile and two. That's at 7.15. And interestingly here, Aidan O'Brien has opted to leave Sir Dragon 8 in, not seen since a good run from him in the derby that we were just talking about with Mad Moon. Still a really unexposed horse, Mark. How high could he fly? Yeah, this guy is still the limit for him. Um, you know, you wouldn't knock him for Anthony he did last time. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough environment to, to step into. So, no, I'll be looking forward. He's the one that obviously has, he he's just jumps out of you. He's pretty obvious that he's the, the unexposed one. But you know what? I give another chance here to Leo de Fury. Um, you know, didn't work out from last time at Goto. It was scrappy That's enough sort of race. That, wasn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. Um, just a horse now that there seemed to be the vibes were strong about previously. So, uh, no, I'd be willing to have a look at him again. And that battle might have met a man of him. But, uh, no, Sir Dragon is obviously the one that stands out. But keep an eye on Leo de Fury. Just going to throw you a curveball. Do you know why he's been off such a long time? Or do you think Aiden was just thinking he's still inexperienced? We'll give him a bit of a break? Not too sure, Manny. I haven't seen Anthem, but I just first thing at the top of my head, I would think is that he's gone very quickly, progressing in a short space of time. And often Aiden likes to give them time then to recover. Like he's gone from a temporary maiden that was a bit of a shock result to then going into Chester, to Chester and winning very easily and then step up into Epsom straight away. It's a very quick progression and um, I'd say Aiden just didn't want to, you know, you talk about the Anthony Van Dyke thing there, Jimmy, it's, it, I think it's a similar sort of thing. You look at the difference, he's gone to the Irish Derby afterwards and he's probably paid the price uh, at Ascot, albeit that's not just, it, it could be more than that. But, uh, you know, just to, I think they've given this fella more time because of, they haven't drilled him from the very start, you'd imagine. He went off a big price to win a Tipperary, maybe he wasn't roaring and shouting at home. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Uh, so Dragon A should be tough to beat if producing his best here. Yeah, but Mark makes the point, you know, he's an inexperienced Colt. Aiden's quite rightly giving him plenty of time to get over that Derby effort. It was a great effort in the Derby. I thought he was going to uh, win at one stage. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, he, he looked like he was uh, going to go through and win it. Um, if he's uh, somewhere near his best, I think he should win this. He's, he's got too much ability for the rest of them, I would say. Um, but he'll probably be a little bit rusty given he's had a break. Yeah, that's true. Aidan O'Brien often doesn't, you know, hammer them mm. for their sort of return efforts. Um, Binners, quickly then, before we have a look at Saturday in the Hungerford. Yeah, you'd have to say Sir Dragon A is the one to beat if he turns up. You know, he was sent off favourite for the Derby and he didn't run at all badly. Um, as the guys have already said, we haven't seen him for a while, so possibly Buckhurst could be one for the each-way players if he shows up. 
for Joseph O'Brien. Um, I, I was quite impressed with his win in the international stakes at uh, the Curra at the end of June. And uh, maybe he could shake up Sir Dragonet, but it will take a good performance to beat that one. Indeed. We're hearing quite a lot at the minute about these sort of seven furlong specialist horses. And another race that they could have been targeted at is Saturday's Unibet Hungerford Stakes, a group two over the seven furlongs, that intermediate trip. Among the top rated, we have first up entered is Hagerman, Space Traveller, Space Blues and One Master. Uh, Jimmy, tricky puzzles to solve often, these ones, I find. Yeah, um, you mentioned One Master there. I, I uh, actually backed her in, in the Queen Anne. I, I thought she was going to win. What an effort. Yeah, uh, I was getting very excited. <laughs> uh, but she didn't quite make it and things went downhill from there for the rest of the week. Uh, but this, this is over seven furlongs, so this should uh, suit her a bit better. They'll have had a bit of rain during the week, which will help her. Uh, and she's got that touch of class, which a lot of these others haven't. Uh, so I will go for her for informed trainer, William Haggis. Yeah. Gosh, she is in form, isn't he? And uh, she was unlucky not to win that Falmouth, I thought. Um, Mark, what do you think of the Hungerford Stakes? Yeah, the seven furlong sort of division at group level doesn't capture my imagination, really. It's nearly like a, a kind of a Ryan Air Chase division on, on the flat for me. It doesn't kind of get me going. And I don't know, I thought two darn hot winning over seven furlongs earlier in the year was impressive. But it's kind of you're between two stools, aren't you? And maybe, look, maybe I should be more open about it and accept that, you know, it's a, it's a division of its own. But I, I like six furlongs that are my kind of traditional sense. But uh, the one that I like here is Space Blues. Uh, you know, just the thought didn't pan out perfectly for him last time against Advertise. The only thing I, I'm worried about that would strike me from being or, or stop me from being extremely confident is he's ran twice in April, twice in May, once in June, once in July, once dogs. It's a heavy old campaign. I just worry if it catches up with him. Um, but I think Newbury will suit him. I think the trip and uh, it, it's what he likes. So uh, I think he's pretty solid as long as the schedule doesn't catch up with him. Yeah, I'm a really big Space Blues fan, it must be said. I think it was interesting. That was the perfect race for him, wasn't it, the Morris de Geeks? And he made up so much ground on arguably the wrong part of the track. I wonder if maybe a really hard run six might suit him more, at six and a half more than this seven. But I do think we've yet to see the best of him. So he'd be my selection as well. Uh, Binners, finally. Well, I'd love to see Hay Gaman win for James Tate and uphold that Paddy Power Minstrel Stakes form. Uh, which Romanised advertised so well at the weekend. However, um, Hey Gaman was comprehensively beaten by Sir Dance a lot at Goodwood. I, I don't see any real reason why he might turn that form around. So I'm going to go for David Ellsworth's charge to dance a lot with uh, probably Gerald Mosse on board again. Yeah, indeed. Good pairing, those two, aren't they? Um, and again, as we mentioned before, any of those horses interest you, then get on to our Racing Post app with all the best sign-up offers from the bookmakers there. You're sure to lock on to some value. Check out Paddy's Rewards Club. Simply place five bets of £10 or more across any sport in a week and you'll get a free £10 bet then next week. TNC Supply, 80 plus, begumbleaware.org. Welcome back to this final instalment of the Monday Postcast. The midweek racing is our next port of call. I'll spin you through the meetings quickly. Tuesday, it's Nottingham, Fosslass, Lingfield, Carlisle. Wednesday is Beverley, Newton Abbott, Salisbury, Worcester, Gorham Park, Kempton. Thursday is Salisbury, Beverley, Lingfield, Yarmouth, Leopardstown, Chepstow, Tremor. And Friday is Wolverhampton, Newbury, Nottingham, Thirsk, Newmarket, Chelmsford and the Curra. Who is your next best this week, Jimmy Hill? Uh, on Thursday in the 420 at Salisbury, I couldn't help noticing in the Phillies handicap uh, the name Sea of Faith, um, mm. who was pretty disappointing last time. Um, but for all the hype that surrounded her this uh, season, uh, let's not forget William Haggis actually entered her for the arc. Um, with that amount of potential, I think she's got to be of interest here off 95. Um, and I mean, her trainers are a real specialist in this sort of grade. 30 winners in, in three year old handicaps uh, this year. Wow. And, uh, you know, as you say, we, we yet to see the best of her. That was a muddling race last time, wasn't it? I thought they all finished in a bit of a heat. She was disappointing there. Um, I'm willing to give her another chance, though, because her previous run at Newbury um, wasn't too bad. So, yeah, she'd be well treated on that on that form. Indeed. Uh, and Mark? Yeah, the one I like is in the 7.35 at Leopardstown. Um, I like to look at Luke, great grey for Luke Comer. Um, you know, just a horse he, he run, second at Limerick there, a couple of starts back. It's, it's a race that I like the form of only human won it. And, uh, you know, last time it, it didn't get entirely a clear run at the Curra. I think seven up to a mile and a quarter will suit him well. And he's pretty adaptable. So great grey for me in the 7.35 at Leopardstown on Thursday. Fantastic binners. I'm off to Salisbury at 3.50 on Wednesday, Maddie, for the listed up Avon Phillies stakes. I'm going for John Gosman's Fanny Logan. I was really impressed with the way she stayed on um, in a race at the same level at York last month. And uh, I think she's got a massive chance of going in again. 
Yeah, another star fully for John Gosden. They just keep appearing out of nowhere, don't they? Now it's time to get the naps. This will not be beaten. Mark Boylan, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I like the look of Historia here in the 7.15 at the car on Friday. I feel you now that is uh, pushing the pushing me patience and pushing a few other things as well at this stage. But I think she has enough ability to win a race like this. I think she's rated 71. I'd be disappointed if she couldn't exceed that at some stage in her career. And hopefully she can begin doing that now. Historia in the 7.15 at the car on Friday. Best of luck with that one, Binners. Uh, Killang Rock in the 3.30 at Nottingham on Tuesday. Maddie, a five furlong condition stakes for James Tate. Um, a beaten favourite last time at Wolves, but um, got to forgive him for that. It was the first start for nearly a year. He wasn't beaten far. He's a course and distance winner, and he was second in this race last, uh, sorry, in 2017, behind Ornate, who has gone on to good things since, including winning the Dash at Epsom earlier this year. Indeed, and finally, Jimmy, your nap. Uh, I think Great Scott could be real good each-way value in the 350 at Salisbury on Thursday. I think if he runs to his ability, uh, he's got a great chance of finishing in the three. There we are. Now, breaking news this morning, of course, that the four-miler at the Cheltenham Festival is no longer. The race uh, sparked some controversy last year with just the four finishers. Uh, jockeys were handed out bands and it, it wasn't necessarily the, the best spectacle. And uh, the race has been reduced. But the main talking point from this is also that there's going to be a mare's chase introduced at the festival in 2021, over two and a half miles interesting development binners and you've got some markets up for us on it we have indeed maddie it's a thousand to one that the cheltenham gold cup is replaced um <laughs> but um heading the market we have the uh the novice handicap chase at five to four we think that one will go uh if not the juvenile handicap hurdle at nine to four it's five the national hunt chase itself which you just mentioned seven the kim muir 12 to one the martin pipe or the brown advisory and it's uh 14 to 1 bar. But the reason we've put the novice handicap chase in at the top of the market is uh, we think there's other opportunities for horses, including the JLT novices chase and other handicap chases. So we think that will be the contest to go. Interesting to see which one it will be. Uh, Jimmy, what do you think about these two developments? I mean, the four miler got a lot of people irate, didn't it, this year? Yeah. Um in a way, it's very sad. I mean, we're talking about a, a race with a, a huge amount of history. Um, but I, I do think conditions had to be changed. We, we can't have, you know, finishes like uh, we did uh, in March. And I think uh, really just had had to make it a bit easier, um, get jockeys in with more experience and horses win, in with more experience and so on. Um, so I think that was inevitable. Um, if you're asking my opinion on the new race, um, I mean, if, if you ask me which... Uh, races should go at the Cheltenham Festival, I would say, you know, one of one of the mayor's hurdles, if, if not both of them. So the fact they're adding a mayor's chase. Not a fan. Well, no, that, that's a bit depressing. Um, I mean, I, I don't, f look, I could be wrong about this, but I do think that is a public opinion that, you know, if, if you ask people which race should go at the Cheltenham Festival, they would say one of the, the two mayor's hurdles. I mean, you know, the, Cheltenham is a public event. So you would think uh, public opinion would have some sort of influence on that decision. Yeah, indeed. I think the mayor's programme has sort of grown and grown and grown in recent years, so it's good that they would have sort of a finale to aim at. But I'm with you, it does dilute it a little bit. And I like to see these mayors taking on the geldings in the big races where possible. But who knows, maybe it'll grow in popularity. And I do like seeing these mayors battle it out at Cheltenham, so I'm sort of divided I'm, in my opinion. I'm not, I'm not anti-mayors races and um, look if these mayors races were very competitive at the Cheltenham Festival then great but I mean the fact is they haven't been we've had a lot of odds on winners um, it's not working out as they hoped and uh, you know so when you think of veterans chase how, how popular those events have been I mean it, it is I, I think a bit, bit strange that they've opted for a mayors chase over something like that yeah I'd love a veterans chase at Cheltenham but anyway less from me Mark what are your thoughts yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it, Manny? Um, from my point of view, I'd be similar thinking to yourself. I think one of the biggest enjoyments I got in recent years at Cheltenham was seeing Annie Power beat the boys in the champion hurdle. So creating a point where you're... I think you, there's two ways you can view it. You can say that you're crowning a champion mayor and you can acknowledge that's a division of its own. Or you can view Cheltenham as the cauldron which you create a champion overall. And I nearly like to opt for the latter half of it. Um, 
you know, I think the the more races we have at Cheltenham, the more you're you're pushing towards five days, which is not something that I'd like to see. Um, you know, although it's probably the traditional view, but uh, you know, from from the point of view of, of this. It's, you know what's going to happen is more than likely that William Mullins, Nicky Henderson and the lads who have some very, very smart mares, it's, it's going to be a clash between them. And maybe over time it'll grow, but my first feeling was it's not a race that we exactly needed. Um, I understand where you're coming from with the veterans, Chase. I think they're brilliant to watch on a, on a, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis at, at the big tracks. Um, maybe just from a risk point of view, it would be for a PR standpoint. If that did happen to a veteran at the Cheltenham Festival, it wouldn't be something that you'd like to be seen to be, be able to, to held against you, for example. you know, I think you're just trying to keep it as safe as you can, limit as much risk as you can. And I'm not saying that veteran traces aren't safe, but just uh, it's probably something we don't need at Cheltenham at this point, albeit it would be a great spectacle. OK, and what do you think about the, the changes to the four-miler? Yeah, they probably make a bit of sense. Um, you know, the, last year wasn't pretty to watch at different points. Um, I don't like making a judgment on one year, but and I think it's been a great race down through the years, but mm. there have been incidents. Um, it has a rich history, and I think in recent years we've seen a better quality horse uh, that we mightn't have seen previously. Uh, and maybe this is just kind of just confirming that really with these changes. And um, I feel sorry for maybe some of the younger jockeys or some guys that kind of rules out maybe a little bit of a fairy tale element of it that you could have a a, a young jockey coming through and, and do that who was let's say a guy who was successful in point to point coming through to try and do it. But I, I don't know if it's really going to have a huge impact to be honest. Um, no, I I think it's probably they're all kind of they make sense some of the changes, don't they? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think. You know, you touched on there some of the quality of the horses that have won it, the likes of Tiger Roll, Cause of Causes, Native River was placed in it, of course. So it clearly is a, a very popular race and uh, does throw up some talented horses, but makes sense from a welfare perspective and, and moving forward with the sport. Binners, do you have anything to add? Um, just really uh, uh, about continuing on the new race, Maddie. We think that Willie Mullins will be the main benefactor of the introduction of this new mayor's chase. And... It's interesting that we make Willie only three to one to train the winner of all three mares only races at the 2021 Cheltenham Festival. So uh, Willie and his team, Ruby and uh, David Casey and people like that, they'll, they'll probably be celebrating the introduction of this new race. Yeah, they certainly will. I think that's a bit depressing, though, isn't it? You like to see, as Mark said, some of the success stories, the fairy tales in, in these big races. So it would be a shame if it just gave them another option to aim one of their best horses at, wouldn't it? sporting events are meant to be competitive you know e even when, when you're talking about great horses you want them to have competition and you know gi giving uh, these big yards you know with their, all their great horses more opportunities you know to have, have a, um, an easy an easy race to target at I mean it's not the way I'd go I mean look so someone thinks someone thinks that you know these mares races at Cheltenham are, are eventually going to prove very competitive and you know strengthen the breed yeah strengthen and, the breed yeah. and great I mean it's a great idea but look from what I've seen so far that is, it's just not working out that way mm. you know we, we, we're Corvega won it how many times on the bounce I mean no disrespect to the horse she was fantastic but I mean she should have been running in champion hurdles stayers hurdles you know, she she was miles the best horse every time she ran, and it, 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 that's not Cheltenham for me. Okay, so a controversial point to end this week's postcast on. Then. Uh, join us next week for more views and reaction to the week's racing. We'll see you next time, and best of luck with your bets. Paddy Power Games has over 250 of your favourites to play online, and we're going to attempt to name them all in this 10-second ad before the T's and C's kick in. There's Blackjack18plusbgumbleware.org.